Hello, this is Michael Altos, and we are talking about local anesthetics. This is recording part one. Local anesthetics are drugs that can cause loss of sensory, motor, and autonomic function. Local anesthetics work at the cell membrane. Remember that the cell membrane has a resting potential, which is due to that concentration gradient created by sodium and potassium and the sodium-potassium ATPase pump. The potassium is pumped into the cell and the sodium is pumped out. There are voltage-gated sodium and potassium channels which can depolarize the membrane and lead to an action potential. Local anesthetics are believed to enter the cell and then bind to these voltage-gated sodium channels. In this way they prevent sodium from being influxed into the cell and they slow conduction of the action potential. There may be other mechanisms of action with local anesthetics binding to potassium or calcium or NMDA receptors, but our primary focus is going to be sodium channels. Now let's go over the different types of nerve fibers we find in the nerves. There are three main types, A, B, and C, and then an A delta subtype, which is really its own special type. The A type nerves are the biggest and the fastest conducting. They usually serve the function of motor activity, as well as transmission of proprioception and pressure. Skipping over A delta for a moment, the B fibers are medium size and medium speed, and are typically found in the autonomic nervous system in the preganglionic axons. Type C fibers are the smallest and the slowest. They transmit pain and cold temperature, as well as some postganglionic sympathetic fibers. The A delta fibers are similar to the C fibers in that they are small and slow and also transmit pain and cold temperature. We need to understand the concept of differential block, which states that different types of nerves are going to be more or less susceptible to blockade from local anesthetics. That is to say, autonomic fibers tend to get blocked first, and then sensory, and then la lastly, the motor fibers. To understand this, we should first look at the anatomy of a nerve. So a nerve fiber, or an axon, is surrounded by, and let's just find one here, here's an axon, and it, the axons are surrounded by endoneurium. Then they are bundled into fascicles, and the fascicles are surrounded by perineurium. CT here stands for connective tissue, loose connective tissue. That's what the endoneurium and the perineurium are. These fascicles are then bundled into nerves. A nerve is a group of fascicles together with some blood supply, and the whole nerve is surrounded by epineurium, which is a dense, tough, fibrous connective tissue. The other thing we should be aware of is myelin. Some axons, going back to the previous slide, you can see the myelin sheath around the axon. Zooming in on that, each axon can be surrounded by myelin sheaths. And the myelin is not a long strip of insulation like an electrical wire. Rather, it turns out that most nerves have myelin, but a myelinated axon usually has this spiral surrounding layer of myelin, and it only lasts for a short distance. Then there's a node called the nodes of Ranvier, and then another myelinated portion. Unmyelinated axons may also be exposed to myelin, but in much less of a layered fashion. Now, some people think that local anesthetics have to fight their way through this myelin, but that's not true. The local anesthetics can bind at these nodes between the myelinated segments. And so it turns out that you might think myelinated fibers are more resistant to local anesthetics because of their myelin sheath, but in fact, they may actually be more sensitive to local anesthetics because of these nodes. And in Miller's Anesthesia, he writes that this generalized notion that local anesthetics block the smallest fibers first or most is clearly wrong. So now that we understand the structure of the axon and of the nerves. Let's summarize. The small fibers, or the C fibers, are more susceptible than the large fibers, like the A fibers. 
myelinated fibers like B fibers are more susceptible to local anesthetic block than non-myelinated fibers like the A delta and C fibers. And ultimately the sequence of differential block is first B, then C, and then finally A fibers. So functionally what we see is that autonomic fibers tend to be blocked first, then sensory fibers, and last the motor fibers. Recovery of block as the local anesthetic wears off occurs in the opposite direction. First motor fibers recover, then sensory, and finally autonomic fibers. The next part of our introduction looks at the local anesthetics themselves. Local anesthetics usually have a lipophilic part, a hydrophilic part, and then an intermediate chain. And the intermediate chain can be an ester or an amide. And we'll talk about that more shortly. Local anesthetics are weak bases, which means they are molecules that can accept a proton to become charged. I told you at the beginning that we would see this kind of acid-base chemistry again, and here it is. There's our equation, the base accepting a proton to become a protonated species. And the protonated species is more potent, as we're going to see in just a moment. The pKa of most local anesthetics is just slightly above the pH of blood, as you can see here. For the local anesthetic to work, it first needs to be able to penetrate the membrane. The more lipophilic it is, the better it will penetrate. So in that sense, it will do better when it is unprotonated and it's uncharged. However, once it crosses from the outside to the inside, it needs to bind to the sodium channel. And for that to happen, it needs to be protonated. So now, if the onset of action depends on the ability to penetrate membranes, which has to do with its lipophilicity, its charge, and its size, as well as how much concentration you can accumulate at the site of action. Then also the acidic environment. If so, if the extracellular environment is acidic, it's going to push this equation towards the right, and we will have a charged species, which actually is unable to cross the membrane, and so we'll have a slower onset of action. That is why we add bicarbonate to our local anesthetics sometimes, it pushes the equation to the left, increases the fraction that is uncharged, and facilitates diffusion across the cell membrane. Just as an aside, bupivacaine usually should not be mixed with bicarbonate because it will precipitate. One last comment on the previous slide the inside of cells tends to be a little bit more acidic than the outside of cells and that's very helpful because once the uncharged species gets inside the cell the increased acidity pushes the equation back to the right we have the charged species which can bind to the inside of the cell at the sodium channel this is an example of what we would call ion trapping The density of the block, or how numb the patient gets, depends partially on the concentration, because we need enough drug to saturate these binding sites and block action potentials being transmitted. And we also need enough volume that we've blocked a critical length of nerve fiber. So we can't just block one slice of fiber. We have to block a finite segment of nerve fiber. How long does the block last? This mostly has to do with the lipid solubility of the drug that's being discussed. We'll stop here having done that introduction. Please go over this information, make sure you have it clear, and ask me if you have any questions.